session today. that 
this is a cut through a piece of muscle. I've got some type 1s, I've got some type 2As, I've got some type 2Xs. Right? Every muscle is made up of all three types of fibers. It just depends on the ratio of the fibers. That's the key. Okay, so our basic types are these three. Type 1 is the one that can do the most use of oxygen. Okay? And they're the slowest. Okay? Type 2X uses barely any oxygen. Not very good at system 3 at all but it's the fastest. Okay. Type 2A can use some oxygen. It's better than a type 2X. It's not as good as a type 1. And it's medium. Okay. It's not as fast as a type 2X, but it's not as slow as a type 1. All right. So we can identify these subtypes if we take a muscle biopsy. To take a muscle biopsy, they have to actually cut through the skin, stick a little pincher into the muscle, pinch a piece of muscle out. Right? So we don't have quite as much work on athletes, I don't think, as we would like, because obviously if you guys are in season or you're in a big training phase, you're not about to let someone cut open your leg. Alright, so we've got these different speed of muscle fibers and what we want to take a look at is how does the muscle contract. If we know that one is slow and one is fast, what does that mean? How is that contracting? All right. So back in the 50s, someone um, suggested a theory that is called the sliding filament theory. It's changed a little bit over the last 30 years or so. It's slightly different to what it was when I was in college, so we found out a little bit more about how it works. It's still a theory. Right? We're not absolutely certain that everything works the way the theory says, but it's a reasonably good explanation of what's going on given what we can see. Right? So our protein filaments, our thin and our thick filaments, slide over each other and that produces force but the protein, the filament itself doesn't change in length. They just move across each other. Right? Remember the actin is attached to the Z line, so as they move across each other, it pulls the sarcomere shorter and shorter. <coughs> Bless you. Right? So the number of attachments we can see okay, between the myosin head and the actin filament dictates how much force is going to be produced. The more overlap, the more attachments the myosin can make, the bigger the force production. So let's have a look at the details a little bit. All right? When the muscle's at rest, the myosin head can't attach to the active filament. That active site that we talked about is blocked off, okay? It's covered up by the tropomyosin part of the actin filament, and the myosin head can't attach to it. So we can't see cross bridge formation at rest, all right? They're just lying very close to each other, but there's nothing going on. There's no interaction between them. So in order to see contraction, we have to have a signal from the brain, right? And we'll start looking at that electrical impulse in chapter five. Okay, so we'll come back to step one here in the next chapter. We're kind of working backwards. 
the signal, once it's crossed over from the motor nerve to the muscle, the signal spreads across the membrane of the muscle fiber, so across the sarcolemma, and it travels down the little holes in the fiber surface that lead into the T tubules. Ignore this, this is too much info. Right. <coughs> Sarcoplasmic reticulum is the storage space within the fiber or around the fiber that maintains the calcium store. So the impulse that gets into the T-tubule, the T-tubule happens very conveniently to sit quite close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release all these calcium ions into the muscle fiber, into the sarcoplasm. And the calcium then binds to the troponin. And again, we mentioned last week, they talk about different bits of the troponin, don't worry about that. Right? Just keep it simple. Actin, tropomyosin, troponin. And because of the binding of the calcium, we see a little bit of a formational shift in the fiber, in the protein filament. And the tropomyosin moves across and the active site is opened up. And that allows the myosin head for the thick filament to attach to the active site. Once we've got the attachment, the myosin head moves and it pulls the actin along with it because it's attached to the actin. And so we see force production. Right? So we're looking at a shortening action when we're talking about sliding filament theory. So, personally, the big long word list doesn't help me very much, but we have a very nice diagram in the book that I think is a little more useful, at least for me. I, I don't do well with lists like that. So, let me take the scribbles off here. All right. Here's my signal coming down my motor nerve. So this is chapter five. Right. The signal crosses over to the muscle and travels along the surface of the muscle fiber. Goes down the T-tubule, stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is like an enlarged version from here. So here's the outside of the muscle fiber, here's the little hole down into the T-tubule, and then the sarcoplasmic reticulum is like this big netting that's wrapped around the protein filaments. Okay. Out floods the calcium, calcium attaches to the troponin, we see a bit of a shift in the shape of the molecule, and that shift frees up the active site and the, act, the head of the myosin can attach to the active site. Right. At the point at which the calcium stops coming out, we stop seeing contraction. So when the signal stops coming from the brain or from the spinal cord, wherever in the central nervous system it's coming from, then we stop seeing calcium, and once there's no calcium, there can't be any muscle contraction. So calcium is super, super important for muscle contraction. It's one of the reasons why you gotta look after bone health. Because if you don't eat enough calcium, if this store gets low, your body will leach calcium from your bones. It's got this great calcium store right there in your skeleton and it will leach as much calcium as it needs to maintain muscle function. And then we see low bone density. So everything, all the 
all the little separate pieces all fit together into this amazing picture of what goes on in our body. So the head, remember there's that little hinge there at the bottom of the globular head. So the head attaches, it flicks, we have to have some ATP in there for it to let go, it moves around, it takes the next one and it just keeps, as long as there's calcium available, that head keeps cycling around and pulling the actin across. So, they have these very nice diagrams in the book. To me, they're a little bit hard, but they're really good. And if you, if you can take the time to follow them through, I think it's, it would be better if they had cut this in half and put this down here, personally, and had it as one long picture. But this is what's going on. So they've tried to depict what's going on. However, to make our lives a little easier, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. We are going to take a look at this. Um, I need, uh, how do I do that? Alright, how do I get to? This YouTube link does not work in Explorer, and I don't know why, but it will work, at least it did this morning, because I checked it, it will work in you use muscles every day to do activities. This woman is using muscles to breathe, circulate blood, and move her hand to take notes. Your cardiac and smooth muscle tissues are involuntary. You do not consciously control their actions. Skeletal muscle works under voluntary control. Skeletal muscles are composed of bundles of muscle fibers. Muscle fibers are long cylindrical cells containing several nuclei. Muscles will contract or relax when they receive signals from the nervous system. A neuromuscular jump. Sorry, oh, I didn't know it would do that. The junction is the site of the signal exchange. This is where the synaptic bulb of an axon terminal and muscle fiber connect. Muscle fibers are composed of many myofibrils. A myofibril contains contractile units called sarcomeres. Sarcomeres run adjacent to one another down the length of the myofibril. Each sarcomere consists of alternating thick and thin protein filaments, giving skeletal muscle its striated appearance. The muscle contracts when these filaments slide past each other. The thick filaments are myosin, which are anchored at the center of the sarcomere, called the M-line. The thin filaments are composed of the protein actin, which are anchored to the C-lines on the outer edges of the sarcomere. Because the actin filaments are anchored to the Z-lines, the sarcomere shortens from both sides when actin filaments slide along the myosin filaments. Although the action between the filaments is described as sliding, the myosin filament actually pulls the actin along its length. The cross bridges of the myosin filaments attach to the actin filaments and exert force on them to move. This action is known as the sliding filament mechanism of muscle contraction. In this model, the sarcomeres shorten without the thick or thin filaments changing in length. A contraction begins when a bound ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. This causes the myosin head to extend and can attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. An action called the power stroke is triggered, allowing myosin to pull the actin filament toward the M-line, thereby shortening the sarcomere. ADP and inorganic phosphate are released during the power stroke. The myosin remains attached to actin until a new molecule of ATP binds, freeing the myosin to either go through another cycle of binding and more contraction, or remain unattached to allow so muscle, to relax. muscle contraction. Right? 
Right? Muscle contractions are controlled by the right. actions of calcium. The thin active filaments are associated with regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. When a muscle is relaxed, tropomyosin blocks the cross-bridge binding sites on actin. When calcium ion levels are high enough and ATP is present, calcium ions bind to the troponin, which displaces tropomyosin, exposing the myosin binding sites on actin. This allows myosin to attach to a binding site on actin, forming a cross bridge. Calcium ions are stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are released in response to signals from the nervous system to contract. Neurotransmitter molecules are released from a neuron and bind to receptors, which depolarizes the membrane of the muscle fiber. The electrical impulse travels down the T-tubules and opens calcium stores. Calcium ions flow to the myofibrils, where they trigger a muscle contraction. As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z lines draw closer to the M line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison, a muscle can produce enough force to move the body, allowing you to take notes. Ha. All right. Let's we like animations. They always make life simpler. In your textbook website, when you go to the student resources, they have a lot, they have a whole list of animations for different things within the textbook. All right, so um, I would encourage those of you who are visual learners um, to use animations as much as possible because I think they make life a lot simpler. All right. So we have to have ATP in order to break the bond to release the myosin head from the actin. If I didn't have ATP, the muscle contraction would kind of get stuck. It wouldn't con continue to contract. All right. And that ATP then is coming from our ATP PC if it's very, very quick. Glycolysis if it takes a little bit longer and system three oxidative phosphorylation Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain if we're moving for more than three minutes. Okay. So that contraction, that cycling of the myosin head is going to continue until the signal stops or it will slow down if we start to run out of ATP if we're fatiguing in a particular event. Right, so 400 meters, killer event, 400 meter hurdles, even worse, right? Killer events. If you watch 400 meters, they're like running backwards as they come around the last bend in a 400 meter hurdle race. Okay? They're slowing down. Generally, the strategy is go out as hard as I can and hope to heck I can hang on long enough that the guy behind me doesn't catch up, right? Can I keep producing ATP quickly enough for this muscle contraction to occur? So, all right, we have the contraction. We've got shortening of the muscle, if we're looking at this theory. How does the muscle lengthen back out again in order to relax? Because what we don't have is anything this doesn't this system doesn't kind of reverse and push the muscle push the fibers back apart again push the filaments back apart right it's only involved in pulling the filaments across each other and pulling the z lines closer together so in order for relaxation to occur and the muscle to return to resting length there has to be an external force so what we have is either gravity or the action of an antagonist muscle. <coughs> it applies a force and moves the bone and because the muscle is no longer contracting as the bone moves, 
it pulls on the tendon, pulls on the muscle, and pulls all the filaments back into their original position. And then they're ready to go again. Right? So if you think about it, okay, if I bend my arm, in order to straighten my arm, depends where my arm is, right? If I do this, and I turn this contraction off, gravity is going to pull on the bone and pull it back down. But if I do this, and I turn the muscle off, okay, now gravity is not working, because gravity is pulling this way. So the only way to straighten my arm is to contract the antagonist and pull the forearm back out. Okay. So sliding filament theory is purely about shortening the muscle. Question. is or what a particular muscle is doing. Right? When we're doing sport, I can't spend my whole sport activity looking at my legs, working out whether they're bent or straight or... Okay. So we have to have information coming from the muscle telling the central nervous system what is going on in that muscle. Do you need to contract it now? Do you need to switch it off now? What's occurring within the skill? Right? How much force is there in the muscle? So the term proprioception is talking about how your body knows where things are and what is going on within that muscle and tendon. Right? Constant flow of information back to the central nervous system. So we have major, major feedback bombarding the CNS all the time. So that feedback, when we're looking at muscles, that feedback, we have two different versions. One is going to tell the central nervous system what is going on with the length of the, the stretch on the muscle, the change in the length of the muscle. And the other one, is going to tell the central nervous system how much force is being produced via the muscle through the tendon. So proprioceptors are receptors that are picking up that information, sending it to the central nervous system. Okay. The central nervous system typically is going to use that information subconsciously. You're not even aware of that information most of the time. Right? There are occasions when you are consciously paying attention to, like, if I'm down in the weight room and I'm really, really focused on squeezing hard, can I push out just a little bit more than I can if I'm off in La La Land? Right? So I can focus on that information if I want to, but typically we don't. The brain just uses it and we see coordinated movement as an outcome. It allows for learning effects. So when I'm learning a new skill, the goal is to be able to repeat that skill over and over again. That means my brain has to learn what does and doesn't work when it turns the muscle on and off. If I go back here, when I'm learning a skill, do I turn on the fast twitch fibers or do I turn on the slow twitch fibers? When do I turn them on? When do I turn them off? Do I want to, am I landing on my face or am I landing on my feet? Right? The brain has to learn whether the signal it sent has the outcome that it wants within the muscle. And if it does, it's got to be able to learn that pattern. Right? 
right? I turn this one on, then I turn that one on, then I go back and turn this one on again. Part of learning is getting all this feedback. So that requires practice when you do a skill really well. If you ever get that feeling it just felt right, I didn't have to see it. It just, it felt good, right? I know when I do it right because it feels right. It feels right because you're getting all this feedback. So the feedback when we're looking at the muscular system is from two different receptors. The first one is muscle spindles. Muscle spindles are located within the skeletal muscle itself and it's a long thin receptor that lies in parallel to the muscle fibers. So it runs from one end to the other end. Okay. And it does two things. One, it picks up the signal. So, how much stretch is on that muscle? What's going on with the length of the muscle and how quickly is it happening? And then it's responsible for sending a signal to the central nervous system which will then initiate a contraction in the muscle to protect the muscle from this stretch. So, <coughs> The muscle spindle itself doesn't initiate the contraction, but it sends the signal that initiates the contraction. Right. So a stretch reflex then is a similar concept to that stretch shortening cycle that we discussed the other week. Right. If I stretch a muscle very quickly, we see an immediate contraction within that, it's a skeletal muscle. You see an immediate contraction in that muscle. So it's a protective function because if I stretch the muscle really fast and my central nervous system didn't know about it, then, ha then the stretch could keep going and I could tear the muscle. <coughs> okay? So it initiates the contraction to protect the muscle. That can be good in some instances. I can utilize the stretch reflex within a stretch shortening cycle and initiate more power because I've got an unconscious contraction that I can add to my conscious contraction of the muscle. Right? But when we look at flexibility training, that stretch reflex can cause a problem now because now I'm trying to stretch the muscle on purpose and the muscle spindle is sending signals that come back to tell the muscle to contract. Well, if I'm trying to stretch something that's trying to contract, I can end up tearing it. That's why flexibility training is pretty clever, right? I have to do it just right, otherwise I'm going to do more damage than I am good. So here's my regular muscle fiber, right? This is just my regular bit muscle. It's called the extrafusal muscle. And then the muscle spindle lies in parallel and it has some cells that are very similar to muscle cells so they call them intrafusal muscles. Oops, go back. Here's a nerve wrapped around the spindle, goes off to the spinal column, tells the central nervous system the muscle's being stretched. Then there's nerves coming back, motor nerves coming back from the spinal column to the regular muscle tells the muscle to contract. So we can see a training effect here. If you look at this, there's the ability to see a training effect when they look at people who are very skilled at movement, then it appears that the central nervous system can adjust the length of the muscle spindle 
to make it more sensitive to what's going on in the muscle. So part of becoming skilled, when I see someone do a skill really, really well, is something, is a learning curve within a totally subconscious reflex kind of system. So receptor number two, we said length and force. Receptor number two is responsible for monitoring what's going on with force production. Golgi tendon organ or GTO. Right? And the GTO is located at the muscle tendon junction. So at the point where all the connective tissue is joining together and turning into a tendon, that's where we see the Golgi tendon organs sit. All right? So they, a lot of them. And their job is to tell the central nervous system what the force production is like. Okay? So I have to respond to how much tension there is in the tendon. And remember, the force or the tension on the tendon is coming from the force generated in the muscle. So it tells the central nervous system whether or not there's too much force being produced that could cause damage. It also allows the brain to learn, did I turn on enough motor units, did I turn on enough muscle fibers to achieve the outcome of the skill? Right? If I know how much force was produced within the muscle and I land on my face, then I need to produce more force in the muscle turn on more fibers. So how much force? Excessive force, you see lots and lots and lots of firing from the Golgi tendon organs back to the spinal column. And again, it's got a safety, it's kind of a safety mechanism because if the muscle is producing more force than the tendon can manage, and the tendon might rupture, that wouldn't be good, or the muscle might rupture. Or the force could all get transmitted to the bone and the bone could rupture. Right? You could see a break. So it's a, another mechanism, it's just in place there. It gives the brain information it can learn from in order to control the skill properly, but it also has a protective mechanism because it tells the central nervous system if there's too much force all of a sudden. And we'll come back and look at this when we look at um, resistance training. One of, the, one of the things that we see in resistance training is a tendency for the response of the GTO to kind of turn itself down a little bit. If I'm trying to bench press lots and lots and lots of weight, then I would have to produce lots and lots and lots of force. Well, when the signal leaves the GTO and goes to the central nervous system, the central nervous system sends a signal back to the muscle to relax a little bit. It's too much force, you need to turn off a little bit. If I'm trying to push a 1RF, and my muscles suddenly turn off, where's that bar going? Okay. On my face, this isn't good. So, part of training is learning to adapt either the response to the GTO, or maybe turn the GTO down a little bit, so that it doesn't fire quite as dramatically when I deliberately increase the force within the muscle. So we know proprioception can be affected by fatigue. So we see more injuries that you would expect not to happen. If this mechanism is in place as a protective factor, then how do we see, I, I ruptured both my Achilles tendons. How can that happen? Right? Because according to this, that amount of force can't be generated because 
the central nervous system will have turned the muscle down. Right? So it doesn't always work. We still see the tear in the muscle when we stretch it. But we see more of those kinds of injuries when there's fatigue in the system. So fatigue is training when we're fatigued is not a good plan. And part of training appears to be mitigating the role of fatigue, right? And those spindles and GTOs are more resistant to the action of fatigue with training. So here's what they look like together, right? Here's my muscle and my bone. Here's my spindle and Always in x -Fiz diagrams, they try to simplify the diagram as much as possible, which makes it look like in this great big muscle, there's only one muscle spindle. Right? That's not the case. There's lots of spindles in a muscle. Right? Here's the nerve, the sensory nerve. So if I stretch, if I pull on this muscle, right, then I pull on the spindle at the same time. The sensory nerve then fires off a message to the central nervous system. It says, ah, getting stretched might not be a good thing. And the central nervous system will send back a signal to the muscle and go, okay, tighten up now. Don't want this stretch to go any further. If there's a lot of force in the muscle and therefore in the tendon, the GTO, they haven't drawn the sensory nerve in here, but the GTO also has a sensory nerve that will <coughs> tell the nervous system there's a lot of force and the nervous system will send back the signal through the motor nerve and tell the muscle to relax. So spindles recognize length, stretch, and initiate a contraction. GTO recognize force or tension and initiate a relaxation. So when we come, when we come back and look at flexibility, <coughs> we're able to use both of those in flexibility training. And we have to find ways of overcoming the GTO when we're training and we're weight training. Feedback loops. Just think, if I'm stretching really hard, what would the outcome be if I keep stretching? Snap. So I want to contract the muscle back. So spindles recognize stretch and the outcome is a contraction. GTOs recognize force, so if I'm contracting really, 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 really hard, okay, that could burst something, right? Something could just explode. And so the response to that is a relaxation within the muscle. And this is subconscious. This is a this is a reflex feedback loop. Now that doesn't mean that this information coming along the sensory nerve, all that information just stops at the motor nerve and goes back to the muscle, right? Because it also will synapse with a nerve that's going up to the brain. So the brain can learn from that information coming into the spinal column as well. But it does mean that all that information doesn't have to go all the way up to the brain for the brain to send the signal all the way back down to tell the muscle to stretch or contract. Does that make sense? Right. I've got a feedback loop going on within the spinal column that does that for me. So the response is very, very rapid.
All right, so Friday, we're going to look at types of muscle actions. So between now and Friday, think about the movements that you're doing, right? When you perform a movement, doesn't matter whether it's brushing your teeth in the morning or whether it's some highly skilled sport movement, right? What is happening in the muscles that you're using? Are they shortening? Are they staying the same length? Or are they getting longer? Right, so be thinking about that so that we can start to look at what that means. What does the change in the length or no change in the length mean when we look at force production?